announcements. Yeah, so I was, I was mentioning, I think that's a good place to look when you're seeing criticism, what, what, we don't, what you don't yet have. I think that's a good place to look because it's going to tell you about somebody's values. If somebody, uh, somebody complains about the lives they're leading, it tells you something about their values, whatever that stuff is, it's not there yet. Okay, so we get a whole. I mean, obviously, we do get conjectured results which you don't yet, which you can't yet reach. So that's a, an obvious form of incompleteness. Um, one, one example that you used again is rather linked to this story of the debate conjectures. But something that emerged from it, he, he made some clever link, uh, linking fixed point theories that came from topology, uh, which rely on some sort of homological. homological Thinking. And he's got this idea that something similar is going on in arithmetic, which seems rather strange because it's a different kind of field. Um, but he, he speculates that we're going to need something like a sort of arithmetic cohomology. Normally we think about this as applying to, to sort of like spaces like donuts and things like that. But we're going to need something that can apply in this, this very discrete area of arithmetic. Okay. Um, Actually, in response to that call, uh, was famously answered by Grossmann, who, who then comes up with a whole battery, thousands and thousands of types of cohomology, which he, um, uh, which apply in arithmetic situations. But there's, and the, but the feeling there was that you have all these different things giving different answers, but they feel like the same answer in some sense. Must there not have been some universal kind of construction behind them all? Okay, so I've got a whole bunch of different. Um, uh, Different arithmetic cohomologies, they're giving kind of what you would expect on certain, in certain situations. There must be some sort of universal principle. Let's take some motives. Okay, you, oh, this is a kind of a, would be a wonderful case study, perhaps in a few years' time, when it settles down maybe. But this, this is a lovely case where. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it's, it's that, uh, you can find, form the matrix group. The fields. Remember those fields? The fields of um, order p is just basically a mod of p arithmetic. P minus one. Maybe you can multiply and add mod p. P is prime, and you can form the matrices of these elements from that field. Now. It looks very like this, the, 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 the field of permutations and elements. Permuting gray in objects, the number of different ways you can permute those around. It seems to behave incredibly similarly to as though there were a field, but a field of order one. It makes a lot of sense if somehow the field of the um, actual permutations on any objects is somehow to be seen as, as a matrix, as a, as a group of matrices with elements from the field with, with one element. But that's really bizarre because fields have a zero, they have a one, they don't need a two to start with. <laughs> what the hell is that about? But there's a lot of literature out there, there's about 12 different attempts to come, come, up, come up with a definition of something like a field, or, or what follows from a field with one element. So that would be a, a lovely case study at some point, somebody at 2,200 or something. They can look back and write a lovely story about uh, this virtual thing, the field of the one element. Um, right, also other bits of, of, of incompleteness, lack of naturalness in theory. I'm famously, so, so Grothendieck setting up his apparatus to resolve some of Bayes' conjectures. There was a famous conjecture that Grothendieck didn't manage to resolve before he left mathematics and went off whatever he became. Uh, his student, Deline, then completes this proof but using using ideas that Grothendieck wouldn't have seen as natural, in borrowing in a way that it wasn't the path that Grothendieck laid out for it to be solved. And there's some negative comments later on of some sort of betrayal process and really <coughs> being betrayed by the okay. So there's a, there's a nice rich, rich resource to, to look at the notions of some criticism, some lack of value in what Deline has done. Okay. And you'll find people on the other side today also you know, that's very good in what Deline did by mixing this sort of pure Grothendieck approach with some other, uh, other style. Okay, um, yeah, well, we can go on and on. We can we can failure to see a generalized failure to define something like uh, there. 
from Milne talking about the bay. The bay was working on these questions in the 40s. It was not known how to define this object. Jacobian variety. In fact, the foundations of algebraic geometry at the time were inadequate for this task, and so in order for the substance to improve, he had first to rewrite the foundations of algebraic geometry. Okay. Okay, so, so we get a bunch of, I, mean, this is a, I think, a very good place to look, as I say, is to look at these reports of something that's missing, something that's lacking, something, something, but with a sense that it can be resolved, it can be, it can be, the gap can be filled. Um, so let's get back to McIntyre and we'll carry on the quotation from where we started. So this is so why why this paradoxical thing where we don't take Galileo to be great and therefore that's why he's written into history. But um, <coughs> the fact that he has this place in the history of science accounts for the fact that he's great. Okay, let's see what Macintosh is saying. The criterion of a successful theory is that it enables us to understand its predecessors in a newly intelligible way. It, at one and the same time, enables us to understand why its predecessors have to be rejected or modified, and also why, without and before its illumination, the past theory could have remained credible. It introduces new standards for evaluating the past. It recasts the narrative which constitutes the continuous reconstruction of the scientific tradition. Okay. So, you live in an era of a certain kind of confusion, certain kinds of, we don't quite know where to go, we're frustrated in certain ways about how we're proceeding. Um, and there can be situations in which certain sort of steps are taken, which then cast an awful lot of light back on that state of confusion. Put it into its context, make sense of it. Suggest, really illuminate whatever, what, it, what were the really important aspects of, of the recent past and what were perhaps the dead ends. Um, okay, um, yeah, I, should, I mean, I've written a whole, whole paper on Makatarian thought and seeing whether that could, could work in philosophy and mathematics. Um, I'm just alluding to a few little bits here. So, I mean, again, I mean, some, some of you, you know, as, as um, Jeremy was asking, you know, the, these things you've been talking about, uh, aren't they applicable to all subjects and all all endeavours, or is there something special to mathematics? That's an important question. I mean, evidently, Macintyre believes he's picking up general, general features of traditions of inquiry, and hoping ultimately that moral inquiry will also have these features, or they ought to have these features. Okay, and so for him, um, they are always traditions, traditions of inquiry are always in states of imperfection. You know, not, not just seen externally, internally, people know that things are not. Uh, there's always some sort of resistance to what they're doing. There's always a feeling of areas in which um, uh, they know they don't have proper cognitive control over it. Um, yeah, you'll hear that too. Talk about lurching from one bit of foggy area to another bit of, a little bit of light gets shone on that, maybe to reveal the more foggy areas elsewhere. You're in a kind of continual fog in some sense. Okay, uh, I won't go into this now. He does have a, a part, a, some sort of part of a sort of, I mean, if you know that literature of philosophy of science from the 70s. Uh, there was a question of, of what to do between, if you've got rival approaches to dealing with some problem, what does one say about whether one is doing better than another? Which, uh, I'll just raise briefly in one respect, and that's, that's in this respect. So Lakatosh, of course, is vitally important for him when he's doing the scientific research programs. And he's very keen, um, in one paper on crucial experiments, to align himself on the side of Popper and Carnap against Kuhn and Pliny, um, in that he wants to give an objective set of measures for what it is to count as progressive. He's a scientific research program to count as progressive. Uh, and talking about science in particular, he talks about theoretical, empirical, and heuristic progress. And I remember way back in the early 90s when I was writing my thesis, uh, I precisely tried to sort of mimic this to see whether you could come up with um, these kinds of criteria for progress in mathematics. And it kind of works to an extent. Um, but there's another line of thought that was going on, and, and something that, that Lafarge is, is, is opposed to. Um, 
is that these criteria for progress change, of course. I mean, why you know, don't see these things as timeless, static criteria for progress? That the criteria themselves change. Uh, and on the side of that, we have something like Dudley Shapir from the philosophy of science, who wants to say, precisely, don't think these meta scientific notions, the scientific notions that we'll talk about, things like confirmation, explanation, and so on, don't see those as static. They're part and parcel of the science itself, and you should expect them to change as time goes on. But, from Shapir at least, they will change rationally. There will be reasons for them to change. Good reasons. Okay. But you know, the worry, though, for Lakatosh is going to be though, that if we do this, if we start to take, if we start to um, allow these, these criteria for progress to become part of the scientific practice, things that change, things that change through a chain of reasons, I mean, who's deciding these things? Who's, uh, so we get left with something like a comparison between his version where you wanted to measure progress against some sort of static criteria. Um, and this other, other field, other school, which is going to suggest that it's um, these chains of reasons for the changes in practice. But then, right, who, who's going to sit above, in some sense, to determine whether there's good reasons why these practices change? You know, when it ultimately be down, so, you know, who are we going to talk to when, if, 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 to the extent we see that the criteria for, for, for mathematical progress have changed, we'll turn to somebody like Frankel, who'll tell us yeah, right, all this work on the language program is wonderful, it's brilliant. You know, it's, it's, it's the way, it's for the good of mathematics that we're following these lines. That's what makes, that is good mathematics to do this. Uh, don't put it down to some sort of objective list of criteria that somebody sort of from the outside could look in and tick off to see them doing this and this and this. But that, that's going to worry something like that. Uh, and he's going to precisely cue something like Polanyi of elitism. Down ultimately to the judgment of the experts. Counts as, as the group. Um, and yeah, it was there in Lacton, in, in, in McIntyre, in a way. Um, in the us. There's an us somewhere. Who's the us? Uh, us. Who's the us there? Who's the one? The criterion of a successful theory is that it enables us to understand its predecessors in a new intelligent way. <coughs> well, I mean, it's not, it's not the man in the street doesn't understand why like, Feynman's version of quantum field theory is a little better than the predecessor. Um, it's clearly the us as the, the we as the, as the person who's been trained in the field. It's the expert who we're going to acknowledge ultimately. Okay, so, right, an issue that I, I mean, I don't have any definitive thing to say about this, but it's something worth thinking through a little bit. If we were if we were really to set up our own research programs, our values research programs, um, and, and look at the course of events that have taken <coughs> the sorts of styles of ways of appraising mathematics and how they've changed through the ages, the sort of history of this notion, what would it look like? Would it would we give it a kind of rational gloss that it's, there's good reasons why these criteria have changed? How would we do that? Okay. Um, so some reassurance We've had, we've had stuff about ethics and, and what, are the com, what do we have? Com, communication ethics. Right, I mean, there's, so McIntyre got into that, that kind of work quite early on in terms of uh, certain sort of virtues that are necessary for you to be a practitioner in an intellectual discipline. There are certain, certain intellectual virtues, um, one, of, one of which actually doesn't often get mentioned, but that is you should expose maximally your current weaknesses. It's incumbent upon you to do this. If you are to find the truth as uh, readily as possible, you should expose what you take to be your own current weaknesses. It's what you, the opportunity for people from other uh, other currents of research to, of course, it will take a lot of time to understand and understand your, what you're saying about these weaknesses. But there's a possibility that they can then cast light on why it is you're experiencing these difficulties. Okay, and other bits of reassurance that it's not just a free-for-all, it's not just wildly swinging here and everywhere, um, would be that at least in this reconstituting, every time we're reconstituting the sort of understanding of the progress of the discipline, there's not this mad um, oscillation in understanding. <coughs> it's great moments, let's look back upon as great moments. It's not as though 
you know, we, in, in 50 years' time, I mean, I asked someone, uh, somebody who works in the Langlands area, you know, what if, what if somebody in 100 years' time said to you, oh, that, oh, that Langland stuff, what a, what a big mistake that was, what a big detour that was. You know, should never have done that. He said, well, mathematically, we just have gone wrong. <laughs> it's so evident here. And, and yeah, they're, they're justified in having this kind of expectation that there isn't this wild swings of opinion about what seems good and what seems like that. Um, coupled with certain kinds of convergences of unexpected sorts of convergences and surprises. Yeah, there's some things that some sort of reassurance could at least be gained from that if you were getting nervous that it does seem to be down to these darned experts to say what's good. So, much uh, so just a few comments. I mean, I suppose one answer, what, what, what then? So that was about inquiry in general, what about something specific to mathematics? Well, I mean, one, actually one probably good answer is just to say it's, it's got its own history. <laughs> history of mathematics is what makes mathematics different to the other subjects. It's an easy way out. Um, I mean, Palani did point to certain kinds of features. This is, this is this. And, yeah, I mean, this is a theme that we have uh, touched upon. This this idea of um, uh, the determinate range of future germinations. So it does seem to be the case that an awful lot more comes out of an idea than seems to be put into it. It just unfolds in, in in a strangely powerful kind of way. There are these moments. Uh, something needs to be said about that. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, so so things I've talked about so far, we, we can start we could start to think about um, applying a little bit more in mathematics. We could give a, a nice chain, you know, some sort of chain of mathematical practices, change changes in the chain of mathematical practice rationale. Well, I mean, historians have to do this, all right? Experts out there uh, do give us histories about why these notions, why notions have proven of change. Elements of mathematical practice that change. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the language of incompleteness is a good is a good place to look. I mean, you know, we're not going to say that kind of thing anymore. I mean, can you imagine Langland <laughs> saying that? Or Grothendieck, Grothendieck said, "They freed of every flaw." <laughs> it seems to belong from a different time. So there's a different background thinking going on. Um, yeah, this thing I, I, I mentioned again and again, um, I, mean, I think we're going to hear enough from uh, Jose about um, purity at some point. But there's a value which probably argues of somewhat diminished importance to be discussed. Whereas this, this, this thing has, has only increased in importance. This idea that you know, it's just wonderful if we get some construction and they zip across through other fields. Um, and, well, if it even taps into mathematical physics and so much better. Okay, um, I thought you've got more winding up now. I mean, I was going to, I mean, I, I, that's something I'm working on. I've actually got some study leave at last time. I'm writing a book on this, this whole topic of type theory. So, new kind of foundations. But this is one, I mean, thinking through that, what, 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 why am I so excited by that? Why do I think this is a very good thing? It's something uh, I'm really going to want to reflect on. Um, I mean, a whole interweaving of ingredients coming from here, there, and everywhere, so many aspects from the whole 20th century funnel into this stuff. Uh, and if it all works out nicely, it's, it's, it's got that aspect too of being able to tell, the, tell us something about the past. I mean, there's been this perception that set theory sort of fails in some sense and that it doesn't stick very closely to the mathematics. Um, were you to render most of modern mathematics into set theory, it would be a complete disaster. That's rather strange. Why shouldn't the foundational language be closer to uh, all the remainder of mathematics? Um, so that's one of the things it's trying to answer. And you can kind of explain it by saying that these things, these things are mere projections, mere low-level projections of my larger thing. That's, that's one of its stories. Predicate logic is the minus one level. Set theory is the zero level. I did it up to infinity. You're, you're just dealing with these two very, very small projections way, way, way down the list. So I can explain to you why, and not all aspects of set theory, certainly not the membership aspects of set theory, but other bits of set theory, I can explain to you why they were useful, because this comes about through having to project everything down to the But then I can also explain to you why it's rather lacking, because it doesn't have the resources. 
So that idea of kind of recasting the past, understanding the failures of the past aspect seems to be there. Um, yeah, right, I'll just... I mean, that, that was always one, I mean, possibly it was because McIntyre was reading Macintosh and Kuhn so closely. There seemed to be a very head-on opposition always. You know, you had a program and its rival program. You had a paradigm and a new paradigm. Um, and even, even back in the 90s, I felt this wasn't a very subtle way of dealing with maths, at least. It seems much more complicated than that. Things don't line themselves up very neatly in terms of um, clear-cut research programs with their rivals. I think that's a very good word. There is a sort of flip side where you could say there's a, and I'm, yeah, as I said, I've been in print suggesting I just could do a little bit better at well, one thing, exposing their weaknesses and two, coming to some form of debate with areas that they could have some bearing on. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I said it wouldn't work, I, something just doesn't work really. I mean, I, as I was going to show you with my book, I think, if you really set it off as just straightforward rivals against each other, it's just not the way it works. Um, yeah, I mean, even, right, okay, I suppose that would be, you could try and dress this one up as, as some sort of battleground between this Hungarian combinatorics and this Hobson Groschendieck style, Langlin style, mega theoretical kind of style. But I don't, I don't think even that's right to see that as a sort of rival. Okay, I think probably. Yeah, so I mean, these are various things I've, I've, I've worked through. I haven't, you know, haven't given you definitive answers. Well, one thing I will be committed to that if you are the intrinsic value in mathematics, research mathematics, you, you're really going to have to at least include at some point some discussion at the very highest levels, right up to really, is mathematics as a whole healthy at the moment? Um, I've got quite a strong sympathy with this line that there's something about resolutions of. of perceptions of failings, that there's sort of periods when there's a lot of interesting stuff going on but we can't put it together. And then there are moments when something happens and you come to see the past in a certain kind of light and it brings together these, these disparate strands somehow. Which does, I still think, you know, there is that issue to be dealt with. I mean, you might think, also, well, who else are you going to trust but the best mathematicians? Who do you think you are to, to judge them? Uh, <laughs> concerns there. And yeah, rivalry, it's not, it's not, it's not quite as, as straightforward as perhaps was suggested by the And on that note, I shall end.